honorable chief guest professor sandeep verma sir director of iith professor b s murthy sir respected deans esteemed faculty members dear fellow scholars and the students from the ug and pg courses we welcome all of you with the 7th iit hyderabad research scholars day that is research scholars day is the culmination of the research scholars days organized in each department of iit hyderabad starting from 15th of april onwards i hope that this event flames the curiosity and kindles the spirit of exploration in the minds of all the participants aim of this year's research scholars day is khoj the hindi word for search representing the quest for discovery in a researcher's life celebrate the quest for discovery in a researcher's life we have the presentations from our own explorers that is the best presentations from departmental research scholars day we also have a series of talks on current relevance colloquiums and workshops lined up for you without further ado let's start the event so i invite professor b s murthy director of iit hyderabad to address the gathering thank you adira as i told you your voice is low some technical snag there but anyway we have to live with these uh, in this uh, online world uh, at least as long as people are able to hear that's good so first of all uh, welcome everyone welcome uh, professor sandeep for joining us uh, readily accepting as soon as i asked him thank you very much sir for the joining and this is uh, a culture that i keep talking to our students uh, which needs to be built any institution uh, which claims to do research should also have a good research culture uh, and these events are a part of this culture building i am very happy that last 6 years we have been regularly doing this and this year particularly every department has uh, gone through this uh, research scholars day and i have come to know from our students that a selected students from each department uh, are going to present uh, their uh, works in this particular uh, uh, you know institute level this is scholars day i'm very happy uh, for the leadership of both adira and akash who have taken pains and with the help of all the departmental coordinators uh, uh, they are able to achieve this this is uh, very important and i am sure that many such events will be brought out by all of you to ensure that uh, we we keep thinking about research you know uh, this is one of the main um, aspects of research for any student i always say this that you should uh, eat uh, and uh, you know drink and uh, you know uh, kind of live into research all, all the time that is uh, the main essence of uh, enjoying research and i am sure that every one of the student in the campus uh, uh, is able to enjoy that of course we have difficulties in the current scenario but we will soon overcome these difficulties and then come back once again uh, uh, in a in a victorious manner uh, to be able to achieve much greater heights uh, than what we are doing so far and and you can see this happening within the last one year in spite of all the difficulties there is a lot of research going on at iit hyderabad in the covid related research starting from uh, masks sanitizers you know even ventilators there is a lot of research that our own colleagues uh, faculty and students put together have been doing it that speaks uh, volumes about the commitment of all of us to uh, you know quality research and more importantly not just the research per se uh, for the uh, sake of fundamental research uh, which also should lead to technologies i am very happy to see a large number of such technologies coming up just about a week back we had uh, our uh, minister for education honorable uh, ramesh pokhrial ji has inaugurated uh, e launch a product that has come out of it hyderabad a, a fast acting and a long lasting sanitizer and many such uh, products have been coming i am ha extremely happy to see all this happening which of, of obviously is an effort of all the students who are sitting in front of me i wish all, uh, all of you all the best and quite a number of new initiatives that iit hyderabad is taking and with that i hope we will be able to grow much faster and much to much greater levels for example you are aware that we are starting what is called id phd program interdisciplinary phd 
this year we are dedicating 30 phd seats for id research where two faculty from two different departments come up with a proposal which a student will be uh, working on similarly we have also started a overseas uh, phd program where we are inviting applications from foreign passport holders uh, to come to iit hyderabad and do their uh, phd we call this as first fellowship for uh, for international research scholars in technology this is being initiated this year we have also just announced uh, two joint uh, phd programs with the swinburne university and deakin university already and we already have got a, quite a number of applications for both these uh, phd applications so we would like to have more and more such joint doctoral programs where our students will spend about a year in these universities which are all in some of the best universities in the world and and learn not only the uh, good quality research but also the research culture that is built in in all these premier institutions and try to inculcate that culture into our system and learn the positive aspects there and try to see how do we bring that in and then help our own institute to grow in a big way so with these few words once again i welcome all of you for this wonderful a day uh, of the scholars day uh, and i wish the whole program all the best thank you very much thank you sir a special thank you for sharing your vision of the bringing the research culture in iith and i now request diksha to take over the proceedings uh, thank you adira uh, good morning everyone uh, am i audible yes okay. thank you sir uh i am deeksha and it's my absolute honor to introduce to you all our today's chief guest professor sandeep verma who is currently serving as the secretary science and engineering research board sir since april 2019 sir is a premier national research funding agency which supports basic research in emerging areas of science and engineering sir did his masters from bhu and then he did a phd from university of illinois medical center chicago in 1994 followed by two post doctoral stints one at john hopkins medical institutions baltimore and second at max planck institute of experimental medicine on his return to india in 1997 sir joined iit kanpur where currently he is a professor of chemistry sir is a bioorganic chemist and a chemical biologist He is known for his research studies on ordered peptide assemblies, metal-mediated nanoscale systems, programmable soft matter for neuronal regeneration, new antimicrobials, and small molecule stem cell modulation. Sir is also an associate editor of Chemical Communications, published by Royal Society of Chemistry (UK), and serves on the editorial advisory boards of journals like. cell chemical biology chem biochem and journal of peptide science he has been a recipient of several prestigious awards such as goel prize jc bose fellowship shanti swarup bhatnagar prize uh, dae src outstanding investigator award swan jayanti fellowship bm birla science prize to name a few he recently received the distinguished alumnus award of bhu varanasi Sir is also an elected fellow of all the three Indian academies: Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, and National Academy of Sciences, India. With this great mind, we are going to have an interaction session after his addressal. So, without further ado, please, uh, everyone, please welcome the swar to our coach, Professor Sandeep Verma. Uh, over to you, sir. well uh, are you able to hear me yes yeah thank you very much diksha for those uh, very generous words of introduction i am so thankful to you and also to uh, my dear colleague and friend professor murthy director iit hyderabad uh, his wish was my command and uh, i'm very happy to be part of research scholar day 7th research scholar day of iit hyderabad and uh, nothing gives you more pleasure if you are in an iit working doing research to be interacting with research scholars they are really are you know sort of motivation they are the they are the sail i mean the 
wind in our sails and i felicitate all of you i wish all of you to do well so what i am going to do today is just to walk you through uh, my presentation and if i can just take a moment to share my slides and every time there is a new platform i struggle old guys struggle a bit to do it right uh, let me see if i can uh, Are you able to see, uh, see my slides? Uh, great. So what I, I was thinking I'd, I'll do today is that not tell you about research per se or an area of research, but tell you because you are all students and very soon you'll become postdocs and you'll become faculty yourself, right? That what are the nuts and bolts when you look at research project planning and execution? That how you plan a research problem, how you articulate a research problem, how you conceptualize, and through scholars like you, how faculty like us or Professor Murthy, how we implement our research project. So everybody has a role to play. And I'm very happy to share my thoughts with you. And as uh, was pointed out by Professor Murthy, that I am presently on secondment to the government of India as secretary at CRB. And my regular job is uh, at IIT Kanpur, where I'm affiliated with chemistry department, nanoscience, biological science, and bioengineering. And the Department of Environmental Science and Engineering. So let me tell you a few uh, uh, words about the organization I represent at the moment, Science and Engineering Research Board. Some of you are aware of it. It's a statutory body which was formed in uh, by an act of parliament in 2008 under the aegis of Department of Science and Technology. We have a very versatile system where we manage the entire research funding, monitoring, and evaluation landscape that would would propel such kind of activity of R&D funding with the most modern science management practices. And you would be very happy to know that at the moment, SERB caters to 1.43 lakh investigators who are registered in our database. So for example, if there is a call for proposals, realistically speaking, you, it would reach 1.43 lakh investigators. And that's the kind of uh, uh, the best practices would uh, only the best practices would allow you to handle so many investigators at a given point of time and our mandate basically is the to establish synergy between academic institutions r d laboratories industry with the help of multiple programs awards fellowship and a variety of other schemes that are supported by scrb if you want to look at the sort of a, a portfolio which is of course cannot be full in in one slide we are looking at four separate verticals where we offer you research grants to a variety of funding mechanisms. We also offer you fellowships and awards, which are listed here. JC Bose, Vajra, Vajra incoming faculty fellow from, from uh, foreign countries, Sub Star Award. We have outreach programs for equity and empowerment uh, to support colleagues from uh, colleges, from sort of not so known universities and we also have a very strong industry connect program where we we are going we are supporting uh, quite a number of pis in their research when they are bordering or interfacing with industry so this is a very broad research portfolio of scrb and if you look at the numbers the sheer numbers from 2019 and 2020 i have excluded 2020 and 2021 because much of that year was gone through pandemic a lot of work was disrupted but if you look at it uh, in 2019 and 20, we had close to 35,000 submissions and we gave out quite a number of sanctions, about 11,000 sanctions. And the numbers are not important, but what is important for us to know as a, as a, a sort of fellow students or fellow scholars is that SCRB is the lifeline of R&D at the moment in, in, in this country, reaching lakhs of investigators. And we what we do is we crowdsource disruptive ideas. We require good ideas where taxpayers' many, money can be put in and we could get results which are uh, aligned to national missions, which are which is aligned to, which are aligned to national needs. And this entire eco ecosystem of R&D is supported by us through a very efficient management system of projects and finances. So this was a very brief uh, introduction to SCRB. Of course, some of you as a research scholar do not really interact with SCRB directly. But as soon as you finish your PhD, 
the first project many of us would write is for national postdoctoral fellowship and that is supported by scrb right so now i'm going to tell you uh, what what exactly is the uh, topic for today i'm going to walk you through a variety of steps that come into being when you are trying to write a project when you're trying to bring in money or your supervisor is trying to bring in money and how you execute how you conceptualize how you implement and execute your project because you are a very critical part of this system is going to be sort of narrated and i hope you will be able to appreciate uh, uh, the the workflow of extra mural project approval submission and approval so so basically such kind of systems start with an investigator your supervisor where where the supervisor has to present a very compelling need or or has to present a compelling argument that why her or his proposal should be considered favorably right and it would depend on its their success as independent investigators so before they join an iit or before they come here they should have a good academic background excellent research training and well published papers so that their competence can be judged based on what is on paper and that is where the the competence is going to be translated to outstanding research problems sort of created or crafted by a principal investigator so investigator has to have competence and they finally should have realized what is going to be their research focus for next 5 to 10 years because when you want to be in a research area the idea is not only to publish papers but also leave a mark in the discipline you should have a footprint on the discipline that yes person x y z worked in this area and they have left a substantial body of you know literature or or results that are looked upon they are that are cited and you know they are followed around the world so for for such kind of research focus what you require is contemporary research problems which are not only fundamental in nature but they could be also blue sky problems they could be cutting edge disruptive exponential translational all these adjectives that you would put together with a research focus would come into mind and that is where much of your extramural projects much of your effort in writing the extramural projects is going to take place so let us start with project life cycle so if you look at project life cycle i have divided project life cycle into four stages as you would see the stage 1 is conceptualizing of a project right and i'd like to to sort of quote uh, a nobel laureate paul dirac everybody knows paul dirac is that the measure of greatness in a scientific idea is the extent to which it stimulates thought and opens up new lines of research so your research focus your research thought should open an area it should not duplicate what is going around in the world it's not me to research it not it's not the low hanging fruit because in the early part of your career you want to look at challenging problems because then you can stick to those challenging problems for at least a decade or more right so they should open up they should stimulate thoughts they should open up new lines of research and when you are conceptualizing a project you you really need to find out ideas that are likely to be successful if the proper thought or proper execution is applied so the, it, it depends how original your research problem is and what is the novelty and relevance not only in terms of subject matter but would you matter would your research matter at national or global level national is important we have to realize because everything that we do our fellowships our salaries our research money everything is coming from taxpayers money so we are responsible adults we are responsible citizens we have to be responsible researchers when we are describing a problem and trying to sort of conceptualize a research problem so when you look at project writing right so there are several phases of project writing which are shown on this in this particular uh, uh, slide in this particular slide you start from the initiation process so initiation process would require you choosing it would require you choosing a research problem e even at a phd level right so a lot of work is being done in your lab when you're talking to your supervisor she or he have to tell you that okay here is a bunch of problems in hand then you have to really read all those problems and sort of discuss with them that okay fine given my background given my inclination or interest this is where i would like to work and then you have to present an overview of your research problem the scope and what are the knowledge gap areas where you would like to contribute the ideation is important so you have a problem but how that problem has to be stated 
how the short and long term objectives have, have to be articulated is in entirely your hands. And that also forms the part of not only your thesis, but also part of a research proposal. So the articulation would require how you intertwine objectives. So if you have four ob objectives to your thesis or four objectives to your research proposal, how are they connected? They should not be disparate. So from bullet one to bullet four, the problem should be inter intertwined and they should be connecting the gap areas in that particular research problem or in that particular discipline, right? Finally, you would elaborate, you would you know, draw up an experimental plan, you will draw up a methodology based on what you, what, what your expertise is or where you can gather collaboration or where you can bring in support or, or, or cooperation that would enable you to elaborate a research problem. So that all becomes part of your project writing and conceptualization. So now more important thing is that how to look for a research problem. Right. So as a student, maybe you are not worried, but say a few years from now, you would be worried about it because you are going to be a faculty yourself. Then how to look for a research problem? I am good at a certain area. I'm good at a certain discipline, having done my PhD or postdoc. How should I start my own independent career? Right. So then you have several possibilities that I have put here. That one is that your project could be hypothesis oriented. So you you think of a hypothesis, you articulate a hypothesis, which is a, which could be an unresolved problem of high interest, right? So with the help of your deductive reasoning, you should use that hypothesis. You should use that unresolved problem and try to propose that okay, this is my hypothesis, this is my methodology, and I'm going to work in this area. Try to make a Try to carve a niche in this area. Try to carve, try to carve a name in this area by putting enough amount of work, and and that would be part of your hypothesis-oriented uh, research. You could bring in innovation, right? It could be like a forward movement in a field which is stagnating, a field which is stagnating without any forward movement. You could bring in a disruptive idea. You could bring in an innovative idea too really jump start it, really make it go in, in the forward direction at a faster pace. Or you could think of a risky problem, which is really high risk. There is a 50% chance of you getting you know, bombed. You're not going to work. You, the problem will not work, period, right? So would I take up such kind of problem? Yes. Now, Indian government, Indian funding agencies require faculty members to become fearless in proposing non-incremental and risky research project where there is a certain amount of chance that you would fail, you would not succeed. But in case you are going to succeed, you will actually bring quite a bit of revolution in this in your area. And finally, with all this, the idea is to create a signature, as I had pointed out, that after working on a problem for six to seven years or a decade, people should know if people are talking about 3D bioprinting in any part of the world, they would say, Professor XYZ in IIT Hyderabad, let us call that guy, right? Because they are absolute best in 3D bioprinting. So that signature is essential when you look at, you know, uh, such kind of articulation research problem. And one such example of non-incremental risky problem is uh, uh, portrayed in Serb Supra, which is a project uh, scheme in SERB. And some of you may wish to have a look at it. It is for transformational thoughts. It's for really, really risky projects where the rewards are going to be outstanding. Now, how do I source my ideas and research problems? A variety of possibilities are there. You first of all, you have to look at relevance and contemporary nature. You, you cannot be working on Newton's first law suddenly because, you know, it's, 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 you, know you cannot make a dent in that area, right? So you would rather go and read literature, read research papers, find out what are the outstanding questions of high value. You try to attend as many lectures as experts, even if they are not in your discipline, right? So, so you have to attend conferences nowadays, virtual conferences. You could lo look at what are the blue sky problems. And sometimes people put it on the on web, people put it on the websites that here are grand challenges. Nobody knows how to solve them. You should go through that. You should find out, is it possible to provide a hypothesis? Is it possible to provide a theoretical proposition? And then you should also look for top-down calls, right? For example, I was telling, sir, that we are going to come up with artificial intelligence in predicting geohazards. So that is a top-down call, means a research call has come. Now you have to rise up to the occasion 
and strengthen that particular area with your research ideas. And then you should also look at what are the national missions, what are the, what are the developing international synergies that you can take part in. For example, FAIR, LIGO, uh, LHC, 30 meter telescope, and so on and so forth. So you should get involved. So faculty should get involved. Students should also keep a lookout and hammer their supervisor. Oh, there is a good call. Let us let us uh, uh, go for it. You know, so because it is then you get transformative products, transformative solutions. And one typical example I'm going to show you because it is relevant for COVID is that long, long time back, uh, Hargobin Khurana had you know put out this paper in 1971 that that there are DNA, there are proteins that would repair short synthetic DNA. So poly DNA polymerases can can also take synthetic sequences and they can repair, they can replicate synthetic DNA sequences uh, as part of their study, ongoing studies at MIT. Now, what had happened is that such type of studies add together the thermostable polymerases, add together the entire PCR chain reaction, which was, uh, or polymerase chain reaction, which was advanced by Carrie Mullis. Now you have QRT-PCR, you have RT-PCR, where from we are detecting coronavirus, right? So slowly, brick by brick, you have built this particular area and which is now being used in cell and molecular biology, in forensics, agriculture, conservation, you just name it. And the, the initial ideas of Hargobind Kurana, from, uh, initial uh, ideas of Thomas Brock, Carrie Mullis, they have brought us to a level that we are able to perform real-time PCR, we are able to produce these diagnostic kits. So DNA amplification is a very classic example that anything that we do now can 20 years or 40 years from now could be of really high value. Coming to project uh, life cycle stage number two is now that you are ready with your ideas, you are ready with your hypothesis. Now, how to write a project? How do I write my, uh, my, my, my uh, research problem, even for thesis or for a big project? And here I quote you, uh, Santiago Raman Kayal, who's, who says, all outstanding work in art as well as in science results from immense zeal applied to a great idea. You have to have energy, you have to have excitement for even the smallest idea to the greatest idea. And uh, uh, Raman Kayal, as you would know, is a, a Nobel laureate from 1906 in physiology or medicine. So when you write a project, you are basically trying to introduce, explain or justify your research problem. And, and you have to really look at the worldview. It's not what you are doing is relevant to India, but what how world level scientists are attempting your research problem. Are you going to publish in some random journal or are you going to compete with your research outcomes in a very high level journal because you are now really competing with, with the worldview, with, with world level problems. So when you start writing and this particular slide is true not only for project writing, but it is also true for when you are writing your research paper, right? Reviewer is your audience. So anonymous people who review your project, who review your paper, they are your audience. So those two to three people have to be absolutely convinced that what you are preparing or what you are presenting is absolutely brilliant, absolutely wonderful. So you have to articulate in at least five different ways that why you want to uh, why, why, why you want a reviewer to believe that what you're proposing is good, all right? So it requires clear articulation of the project. You have to also bring to the notice of this reviewer that what is already known. So you have to be honest enough to tell that, okay, let, it, let, let me tell you, all this is known in literature, but now we are going to propose something really spectacular. So overview of current status, then comes objectives. So you have to keep objectives with very simply, simply, sim, simply, and without any jargon, right? So you have to say, then uh, uh, tell about objectives. You have to show what is the originality in your in your writing, and what is the big picture? Where this entire thing, where your five year research or your ten year research career, or for me like a twenty five year uh, research career at IIT Kanpur, where are we heading? What are we answering? So all this has to be put in in a very condensed fashion for the reviewer, which is who is your audience, right? So you, there have to be take home messages from proposal, the take home messages from the, the papers that pro proposal must convince people that it's a good proposal, right? And and the, the competence of this guy or this student is unquestionable. If they have put their mind to it, 
they would succeed because the work plan is also robust. So the key elements, if I were you, that would put to special attention would be the problem should be modern, as he pointed out, plan, methods, deliverables, all have to be taken care of. And then you have to have novelty in, in your research problem and you always should have plan B, right? What if you what if you fail in your plan A, then you have to have a backup plan that would allow you to bring in plan B, right? Then you have to also believe that if you have a good idea, but if you have not written it well, it is not going to be successful, right? So even if it is a small project submitted to Director IIT Hyderabad or to a journal or to SCRB, DBT, DA, if idea is good but not written well, copy pasted, you have not put your thought enough mind, the time is not spent, it is not going to be successful. So uh, the reason you have to be careful is that because the analysis of your research project, the analysis of research problems, papers, etc., is done at very many levels. So first of all, it should be assessed by you. So if you are a PI, if you have a, you are an investigator, a student investigator or a principal investigator, it should be assessed by you. Then it is assessed by a variety of reviewers, program advisory committee, and basically all of you, if you are a PI, a reviewer or an advisory committee, everybody is trying to do a SWOT analysis, which stands for what is the strength of this particular problem? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities presented? And what are the threats? Means if this is not done, what's going to happen? If that is going to fail, what's going to happen? So all that has to be sort of embedded in a cogent document that is to be presented for people to assess, evaluate, and eventually offer you uh, a project or a proposal or, or money for a given proposal. So the decision making, basically, again, it, it, it involves quite a number of processes. One is, as I had mentioned, research calls are there. So you have to sort of align with the research call. You have to be sure that the advisory committees are happy with what you have written. And finally, there has to be enough transparency. It means once you have submitted, the decisions have to be transparent. Your proposal should also be transparent. It should not be you know, copy pasted. It should not be uh, an idea taken from somebody else, right? It should not be duplicated. So very many things come under the process of transparency, which is which is which is highly ethical. So you have to be ethical. You have to have the correct oversight not to wrong up things. And, and that is part of what is called as project decision making. And we, uh, thus we come to the fourth part of uh, the, the uh, project life cycle, which is managing a project. Means once you get money, at times getting money could be easier, but how to handle money in a correct way with the help of your students or how students are going to use money given by their supervisor in terms of reagents, in terms of compute time in terms of, you know, instrument time and so on and so forth, all that has to be taken into consideration, right? So, and it requires quite a bit of responsibility. It requires knowledge and it requires dedication. And I quote Barbara McClintock, uh, who's a Nobel laureate of 1983 physiology or medicine, that if you know you are on the right track, if you have this inner knowledge, then nobody can turn you off no matter what they say, right? So if you have, if you are on the right track, you have the right problem, you have articulated it well, and if you have gotten enough money to execute it, all you have to do is put your thoughts, put your knowledge, and have the capacity, have the determination that you will succeed once you have chosen a given problem, right? So how you manage a problem is that first you establish a baseline. So it could be a project, it could be your own research problem as a PhD student, you have to establish a baseline that this is where I stand. This is where my baseline is. This is what I know. So what additional knowledge do I have to acquire to address this particular research problem? Because you have to always realize, and I have done it with all my students from student number one to student number 27, and another 15 are working, that, that they are equally clever as I am. I always think that way because, you know, they are really sharp. They are young guys. They read more than I, I because I sit in so many meetings, all kind of uh, funny jobs. I don't spend so much time on literature, but I expect younger colleagues, PhD students to bring in the right baseline that, sir or ma'am, this is where we stand. This is where we would go forward. So you have to assess your, your performance. You have to assess in a realistic fashion what are the parameters of execution. 
and you have to also know that how am i going to benchmark myself right don't tell anybody that you are good or bad or you have done this problem or you have not executed your research well because you are benchmarking your own output you should be you should realize what is expected of me and that is how not only you execute your plan a but you should also have some nimble movement a little movement towards plan b because 6 months from now if your research project as a phd student is not going anywhere you can bring out the rabbit out of your hat oh by the by you know i was also working on plan b let me now uh, work on plan b maybe that will be successful in 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 executing your research problem and that is part of managing project right so for for pis and also for student and post doctoral fellows it is important to manage a funded project in in the proper fashion and i'm sort of rushing because i don't want you to be too involved with the management part that once you have initiated a problem you plan it well you will have to execute with the help of right mentorship and i have highlighted mentorship because that is where supervisors come in that is where your research committees come in that they have to tell you as a student that hey you have been slacking out you are not working hard enough you are not putting your mind on the right set of problems you are digressing and so on so forth so that your your status report your forward movement remains on track and you are monitored you are monitored for your deliverables for your project goals and eventually you would find that research is actually team performance your 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 colleague standing by the side you know in your research lab may also be contributing to your own research problem and and that is where you would have to be you be willing to consider suggestions from your colleagues the colleagues next door in the next lab or in the in the other department so that you can recalibrate your research if it is not going well you can iteratively execute to take it to better levels of perfection right to the to higher levels of perfection and that is where mentorship comes into picture and finally you know you you would finish your thesis of a pi they would close their project by writing the data consolidating the data paper writing thesis writing within the budget that is allocated because that is also an important aspect for administrators when people approach them okay we have run out of money we need more money but then you have to be you have to be working around the budget and finally you have to have a project closure that once you have the right closure then only you can debrief yourself your colleagues i mean uh, lab coworkers and and write a new project right so this is one of the final but few slides that that sort of encompasses the entire thing that i or entire discussion that i have had so far that is here is the time slack right and here are the various phases of pre project ideation you bring up a new idea that is the initiation stage you bring in your finalized research plan that is you have ignited the idea you have gotten the funding for example and then the project life cycle starts so part of the project life cycle is also in the ignition stage and then you have planning execution and monitoring and various levels of it right ups and downs it could be a sine wave it could be whatever you are happy one day you are depressed for 3 weeks and i god knows what but then you 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 find your own way to you know come out of that hole but but the idea is that at the end of the day as a successful scholar you have to have the right deliberation deliverables which are calibrated in a way that you prepare a world class thesis where your institute can be proud of right so that is the bottom line always so just to tell you that all what this would bring because you are an individual professor murthy is an individual i am an individual we are all working for our country right so what country benefits is that they benefit in terms of the the elevation in science technology and innovation through our own efforts right so you would have research output you it would lead to technology translation it could also lead to research overdrive and in certain areas for example we could even establish science and technology leadership around the world right you would develop develop processes you could even have your research deployed in the field right it is totally if, it, if your research is translatable it could be field deployment can also occur your research could be future ready you can provide tech solutions or you can align your work with national missions right eventually that we become a global power of research and development we become a powerhouse and we also become a solution provider to the world this is our overall ambition when we do even a small thesis or 
a small master's thesis all the way to a PhD thesis, we are all contributing in a very direct way, not in an indirect way, direct way to science, technology, and innovation elevation of our own country, right? So just to tell you that I am not only a, a guy who speaks about, uh, you know, uh, uh, philosophies and speaks about processes and, and, you know, procedures at the government level. I also do a bit of research, right? So just three slides to, to uh, walk you through. I work, as was pointed out, uh, in, in antibiotic design. And these are some of the some of research papers that we have come out. And we have been working on antibiotics, new antibiotics, which have been profiled by very many national and international magazines. And more recently, we have been able to take care of an anti uh, microbial infection in rat tibia bone. So the, the leg bone of a rat, we purposefully created an infection. And we were able to show how bioengineering approaches could actually lead to correction of this infection in a rat tibia. So both in vitro models as well as in vivo models. And we have designed specific molecules from scratch. And that's what we call as de novo antibiotic design. We also work on chemical neuroscience where we are uh, looking at the possibilities of addressing problems which are related to neurological disorders, right? So Alzheimer's disease and so on and so forth. And our forte for last five to seven years has been that we are in the process of delivering neurotransmitters, especially gaseous neurotransmitters such as nitric oxide. So question in our lab is, how do I deliver measurable quantities of nitric oxide inside a live neuron, right? Just think about it. So you have been, you know, we have been uh, uh, eating, say, aspirin or paracetamol, but can you deliver gas inside a cell in a measurable quantity? And that's where we work. So some of the recent papers are shown here in chemical neuroscience. And we also work extensively on tissue engineering and structural colors. Means can you develop structural colors the way it is shown for a gecko here or the way it is shown for uh, a peacock feather? And we have just published, uh, in my opinion, of course, I could be biased, a fantastic paper in Journal of Collide and Interface Science where just by using a simple peptide, we have been able to introduce the me effect. And the me effect has been used to create rainbow colors on surfaces. And that is a beauty and really brilliant work by my, my, my students and colleagues in Israel as a joint project. And of course, we have other tissue engineering approaches. And this is where we end with a message to all of our young friends that uh, if I take 30 steps linearly, like if you are young guys, if you take 30 steps linearly, you get to 30. But if you were to take 30 steps exponentially, you get to a billion, right? So this is a very famous phrase and it's stuck to my mind by Ray Kurzweil. He's a American futurist. They look into the future. Like you and I possibly cannot, but some guys are gifted. But this is a very apt phrase for all of us. And I wish all of you, all research scholars who, who could spare the time this Saturday morning to be with us. And I thank you, thank Professor Murthy for this wonderful invitation. I have a special affinity for IIT Hyderabad. One of my students is actually working here in IIT Hyderabad. So with these words, I close and I'm available for any interaction or any question that I would like to have, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandeep. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So you shared the, the process one can follow for project planning and execution, and what all one should consider and keep in mind while writing a project proposal, and how can they get funding to translate their hypothesis to a great finding, and always to have a plan B if A doesn't work. And yes. you also made us aware of the projects that are supported by SERB. So, uh, and so you highlighted the importance of mentorship. Once I heard this, a powerful leader is one in whose room, if you go, you come out more powerful. And so it, it stayed and it uh, really correlated with what you said. Uh, you also briefed us about the research you do the me way and uh, yeah and also what albert einstein once said that the important thing is to never stop questioning so with this i invite 
you all for the interaction session with sir sir uh, we'll take the questions for you sure so i have one question uh, yeah please go ahead uh, so uh, you told that for a project to be uh, accepted the pi whosoever is like submitting the project should have some uh, like should have some done work in that field whatever project he is submitting what if someone has not done something earlier but now they want to do how will they get the funding no one is going to support them see uh, i would answer in a different way i would not answer you uh, by saying that okay see what is required is that when we propose a problem right so a lot of questions are going to be asked because these days there is no face to face meeting but what if you are called to present your proposal and there is a bunch of 10 wise guys and ladies who are going to ask you a question the idea is that your capability should reflect what you are proposing it's not that you have to have knowledge of each and every area before you propose but the tool tool kit that you have in your hand right if you are trying to propose a, a problem in say material deformation yeah so if you know microscopy if you know a little bit about fractal analysis and so on and so forth then you can use that inherent knowledge that core knowledge to propose a new research problem but for example if i am a biologist if i suddenly say i want to design uh, so sort of i want to work in special theory of relativity that is not going to fly right so your your tool kit or your experience your expertise should bring in the right kind of confidence to these members who are assessing your project that you yes you have the right intention you have right the right knowledge but you also possess the right kind of tools that would be required to answer this question and that is how you slowly build build confidence of people in you so your first project first project would be small and you execute it well then you build that confidence write a bigger project write a network project write a big collaborative international project and that is how you blossom right so even for a small flower to blossom you start with a small you know bud right and then you really blossom out after a while this is what is required so let us we want to be in the fast lane we want to get everything quicker but let us prepare the ground underneath where we are going to stand for the next 10 years or decade or two decades first that foundation has to be built with the right kind of uh, uh, training right kind of capacity right kind of experience So, but still, we can learn. Well, like you can learn while working. See, it it may fly once in a while. It may fly once in a while that that you propose something super spectacular without having an experience in that area. But more often than not, when the competition is really high, because you should always realize that there is finite amount of money which is available to all of us to push our project and get money, right? it's like a competition so you have to bring it the right kind of flavor it could be flavor of knowledge it could be flavor of uh, transformative idea it could be flavor of risky project but everything is going to stand on the ground that you have inherent capabilities to execute because i would not go into the detail but sir would tell you we have seen so many examples through our career people are getting lot of money for risky projects without any deliverable right so it is a uh, money is a national waste as well so let us prepare ourselves well so 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 let us prepare ourselves well before we propose anything super spectacular right just let me add one sentence here basically what people look at when you propose something new which you are not worked at all so far is whether you have already demonstrated in some field that you do a quality research okay so you are your cv speaks a lot okay your quality of the publications that you have published so far speaks a lot in front of the committee that yes this person has already demonstrated that he she or he can deliver uh, given a chance and that uh, many a times will be your advantage even if you are jumping into and people want to jump and people should jump 
you know i always say that every 5 years i would like to start a new area okay so that i learn new things otherwise you get stuck hmm? so i don't want to take more time but it is his time thank you sir anybody have question uh, yes yeah, sir uh, it was a nice talk uh, i have one question uh, so like already we have mentioned about the serb has like obdf and then postdoctoral fellowship for the researchers so what are the important notes you want to give to researchers when we apply for the fellowship like what needs to be considered when we apply for the fellowship uh so first thank you for your question first of all this uh, overseas postdoctoral fellowship is stopped at the moment because it is being restructured and given the pandemic we thought it's a good idea a good time for us to restructure the the the, the entire fellowship uh, structure but having said that uh, what we look at is that you should have published well as a student that reflects that you know how much of uh, work that you have done for say 4 to 5 years got translated got reviewed at global level and it got some kind of recognition as a publication right that is one it also depends on the men on the mentor that you have chosen abroad or chosen within india for your national postdoctoral fellowship if the laboratories are good they are doing exceedingly well because see the idea of uh, postdoctoral fellowships for students is that is the next phase of their career so automatically after phd they want to become a postdoc but please believe me because i have gone through the same phase and i don't want to be too didactic here that that when you go through this phase you are at every step you are committing yourself to a higher level of research more commitment more time more level of uh, qualification or a greater level of excellence so when you go from phd to postdoc you should always try to go for a better known person in terms of their i'm, I'm not saying a uh, uh, an older person i'm saying a better known person in their own area it could be a younger person it could be an established scientist so you should find the right mentor who can offer you a great platform to learn something new because for 5 years you have become super specialist in an area of your phd thesis right the area of your thesis but at the second phase for two another two years you want to go and build your career with new tools and techniques so that should come to your mind as you choose your postdoctoral fellowships or when you try to apply and that will bring you benefits Uh, thank you sir i hope it answers your question yeah, yeah. thank you meenu thank you sir hello sir is there someone else okay. hello yeah please hello yes. yeah yeah please uh, nice, a very nice talk professor actually i want just i want to ask one questions like as you said that uh, there is a lot of funding from the srb dst indian government is giving but for the young researchers who is not affiliated with any uh, research institute if they want to start their research at we can say at home only because currently you can see the pandemic so uh, you can listen how can start in a research from your home also so in that case is how we can go for the funding or how the that particular person will approach to the srb so uh, most of the srb funding is at faculty level or it is at the level of postdoctoral fellowship so as you know we do not offer you a research fellowship directly that is uh, the role of csir and ugc right or even uh, ministry of education through gate fellowships at uh, phd as well as at mtech level now to come to your question they are doing research at home uh, i am not sure i don't see you but see nowadays sir the research has come to a, at such a level that you cannot perform research at home so that that is uh, difficult unless you are trying to do a computational work where you can connect to a facility where you can do your computation experimental research is very difficult to be done at home so as much as you and i would like to contribute while the pandemic is on while we are logged up in our homes or in our houses or in our rooms right it is extremely difficult because much of the modern research at this uh, at this juncture is instrumentation driven so you really really require quite a bit of support from a variety of people so what i suggest you instead if you are somebody who is stuck at home that you keep reading think of writing a review so you find a mentor 
you write a state of the art review on a given subject that would allow you to read say 40 to 50 to say even 100 papers and and come up with a good document of review but once the situation becomes normal i'm sure uh, your institute and many other institutes will welcome you back and you can perform a more tangible and more useful research thank you sir thank you very much yes thank you thank Sir, how important is it to do a postdoc? Absolutely important. So uh, nowadays, I mean, somebody as important as director is sitting here. So uh, he is the best person to tell you. He would not hire me if I do not have a postdoc, right? So it's a requirement by Ministry of Education that after PhD, you should definitely have three years of postdoc or you should be an Einstein or something, right? So, or so something super brilliant that they just lap it up like that. But but you and I... If he, uh, if he is somebody like Sandeep, I will take him without postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. See, I can tell you my experience. Within three months after finishing my PhD, I got an offer at Karakpur. Then I asked my supervisor, what should I do? He said, Murthy, a bird in hand is better than 100 in the bush. Please take it. So I didn't do a postdoc, but but I, I don't advise that this is true for everyone. If you get a, a good IIT faculty position, you can possibly go for a postdoc a little later. There are so many avenues for you to go later also. But as Sandeep said, it is always good to have a good but a good postdoc. This is very important that the, the postdoc position where you are going should be to a better lab than your PhD lab. lab. So this is very, very important so that you learn more, uh, you equip more uh, so that for the next job that you are talking about is where you are supposed to guide someone. Mm -hmm. So from a person who has been guided so far to a person who can guide someone, this is, transition has to be built in the postdoc. This is very important. So uh, for example, IIT Kanpur will not uh, entertain yeah. your application without a postdoc. So, that, definitely. Right. I think Kanpur is more, uh, uh, you know, built on a U.S. way this time. Yeah. So that is the reason why I think Kanpur will not touch you if you don't have for that. Sorry, you're saying something? I was saying like it, it differs with every field or like that's the case with all? Every field, every field. Sir, instead of postdoc, if we go for industry job in research and development sector, Will it work? Miss experience yeah. from the R and D. Yeah, I mean, see, there are no set written guidelines, right? So, for example, after PhD, you go and work with Intel in, say, artificial intelligence, or you work with uh, General Electrics in, say, gas turbines, or you know, whatever, right? And with that, with that five years of experience in GE or Intel or such multinational. If you want to come back to IIT Hyderabad, so then you would you should have done exceedingly well. You should have like few patents to show that you have created a knowledge, sort of created knowledge from your own hard work for those three to five years. That has to be judged because see, there are so many applicants for every position. How would you stand apart? So it's so you have to also realize that doing postdoctoral fellowships, industry internship, industrial still stays it's not that you suddenly become a very wise person it just adds to your experience and it makes you stand apart compared to other candidates so given a chance you should always go and get yourself equipped with different you know experiences it could be an academic postdoc it could be an industrial job but if you want to teach if that is your passion like some of us have we have left uh, industry jobs long, long back. We have uh, also given up our green cards way back in 96 and came back to India. You have to follow your passion. You have to follow your what you really like. You have to just do it. And that is only then and only then you'll be happy. Otherwise, you will be chasing somebody else's dreams all the time. I think uh, we should. Uh... Riksha, no, otherwise, yes. otherwise we'll go on until evening. <laughs> oh, you have other programs. Thank you, Sandeep. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, on the behalf of, oh, uh, sir, are you saying something? No, no. 
him. On the behalf of whole IITH community, I extend a big thanks to you for gracing the event with your presence and uh, sharing with, with us your findings and opinions today. Uh, we all are inspired by your great words. And I also want to thank our director, sir, for his constant uh, encouragement and cooperation. And uh, also, uh, everyone who attended this session, uh, once again, thank you, sir, for your precious time. And uh, for further proceedings, now I hand over to Manakshi. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot. So I'll now sign out, if it is OK with all of you. All thank you, bro. Thank you, Professor Sandeep. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Professor Murthy. We'll, we'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, sure.